on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. I think anyone looking back on themselves just like needs to be really kind to themselves. We did the best we could with what we knew and what we had to work with. Yep. And there may have been things that I should have done better or like I should have like taken bigger risks or I should have left that company earlier. Like, of course, I made a million mistakes. But also we also just like, man, we judge, you know, oneself so hard all the time. And we need to be really, really kind to ourselves and our in our past selves that we've done the best we could. Yeah. There's no there's no rewriting those chapters now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry. It's not like a, a, a good sound bite answer. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine-figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high-performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. I'm your host. Today, I've got a queen joining us at the King stage, Luis Fachofsen. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm wonderful. Now that I've got a little bit of rhythm with your with your name, I feel like I could just go to Sweden crushing and it. fit right in. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, no. You're crushing it. Yeah. You're doing it. I, I appreciate you making me feel really good about that. That's, that's step one. one. Stroking the ego, you know, <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you. But I'm so excited for this conversation. You've got an incredibly cool business. I want to get to all kinds of questions that I have for you. But I always like to mention, you know, having the queens on the stage. We've had lots of queens on the stage at this point. But for the listener, like there's queens like you out there getting stuff done. And so what I like to say is, you know, kingship or the king mindset is mindset. It's not masculine. You're out there doing doing the royalty thing. And so I just so appreciate you being here. Tell us what kind of business that you have. Thank you. So I'm co-founder and CEO of Marty, Marty marty.com. We're an online grocery store that helps you save big when saving foods. Me and my co-founder came in and launched this. This is about 14 months ago. It's my fourth company. So I previously had e-commerce, ad network, and marketplace companies. And just before this, Five years ago, I decided that I wanted to really focus my time on the food industry. So it took me a minute to figure out where the big opportunity was to find my Mm -hmm. co-founder. We we were dabbling with a few other things, me and my co-founder, prior to this, launching a few food brands, Mm -hmm. learning everything I could about the food industry and really ran into that issue of surplus inventory. So here's the thing, 30 to 40% of foods actually go to landfill. They are tossed away, even though they're perfectly fine to consume. Wow. And on the flip side, we have 42 million Americans that are food insecure. Um, so Marty really is a play here to solve affordable food and yeah. a sustainable food system. So we're, we're really using that one problem we have, flipping yeah. it to be a solution for the other. Yeah. So with Marty.com, you get 40 to 70% off on foods you love, the brands you know. Oh. So, you know, it's never been a better time to, to try and get people more affordable food. And, and it's fun. You know, we make sustainability both affordable yeah. and really fun, like a treasure hunt. I love, I love what you just said there, because not a lot of people think about food being fun <clears throat> and yeah. more so like, you know, survival, especially in the way that you're doing it, you're literally solving two huge problems and, but you, but you label it with fun. Is that, is that a core value? Where does that come from? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking about Marty. Like I'm building the Ikea of foods. And what I mean with that is like, we all know that Ikea is affordable. It's for the many people, but it's also modern modern and and cool. You never like feel ashamed to have an Ikea furniture or, or, you know, utility in your, in your house. And Marty should be that for food. And what we're doing here is we're building a family friendly company, a modern and cool with design a kid friendly. So like it is fun. It is surprising. And the type of inventory we get once it's gone, it's gone. So there's a level of FOMO. If we have your favorite chocolate, get it now. And maybe a few cases because 
when it's gone, it's gone. Everything yeah. is here to save boots. So it becomes this like fun treasure hunt and it's yeah. like a surprise and delight experience. Interesting. I love the treasure hunt, the surprise and delight, all that language, because you're right. It takes, you know, grocery shopping to a whole nother level of maybe not going. I can even think of like our family. We, there's a lot of the same things that we eat over and over because that's, what's easy when you have kids and a particular husband, but this, this almost like joy, this like binge of like, let's see what we can find today. How do we mix it up a little bit? Yeah, it's fun. And we're we're really trying to make sure that you can get, you know, your monthly staples. We want to make sure that you trust us to get your coffee and your pasta and your pasta sauces at, you know, 70% off. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Then maybe getting that treat that maybe you can't afford when it's at Whole Foods and all of a sudden we have it at an, yeah. you know, accessible price point. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> so you yeah. can start treating yourself with items that maybe was out of reach before since you're saving so much on your staples. Exactly. Well, my my first major question for you here, Luis, is that same for all my guests. I want to know the bigger picture for you. You're four companies in. You're clearly a, a sharp mind. You're, this is probably not going to be your last company either. You know, you your husband, you said, is an investor. Yeah, I can only imagine the frequency that your house is operating at. But But why? What's the bigger picture for you? Why are you doing this? Is it Marty? Is it something bigger? Give us the little <clears> insight here. And to be clear, my husband is not an investor in my company. I have other investors, right. but yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he's a tech investor, which is really cool. So we share, share a lot of the same worlds. Listen, I think there's one level of just like, I love the process, the creativity, the problem solving. I'm so, I just feel so honored that I can do what I do on a daily basis. I get yeah. to choose my team. I get to hire the best people in each of their respective areas <clears throat> and just work with really high performing people. Yeah. And, and just the, the idea and the notion that we're solving big problems is definitely what drives me most today. So that yeah. has changed over my years. It's, it's okay. really interesting to think back. You know, I started my first company when I was 19. And I do think many people, just as I did when I was 19, thought that sort of like, you know, the monetary aspect of things was the big driver. Right. And truthfully, I'm still very pleased when I can take care of my extended family and my my friends and that that is a big driver for me. So yeah. I take a lot of pleasure in making sure that I can take care of people financially. But I came to a screeching halt in my in, in the company that I was running when I was 26. Um, because really that company was lacking a vision or a mission that was more than just making money and having higher revenue and net, net margins. Sure. And I started taking the business into areas where actually the business the business was thriving. <clears throat> but me as a CEO was missing something else. So I started taking it into new avenues to fill what I needed to do. Not a good idea. <laughs> so yeah. I ended up leaving and I ended up like really like doing some deep work and trying, trying to figure out what kind of company and vision and mission do I need to really keep going. And that has evolved in a few different, you know, what it looks like since. But I'm really, really here to build companies that make people healthier. So I know that 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 as a as a mission for myself needs to stay true in the companies that I work with. Yeah, I mean, I think you gave us like a, a really true picture of the gamut there for you as far as like the journey, because you're right, there's a level that you have to take care of yourself. Money is important to a degree, but it, it eventually yeah. becomes bigger than that. It <laughs> has to, right? Because you realize pretty quickly that it's, it's pretty easy to make money. You yeah, know? and it's... And it's a lot of work to run a company. So yeah, yeah. yeah you, <laughs> you start, you start asking yourself if it's worth like it. You can, yeah, I feel like you can make money easier ways than running a company at times. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be about something bigger. You know, the health perspective, even just this being able to kind of pick your environment and pick the people that are around you. I think all those were just incredible answers. I think that, uh, you know, relatable to me for sure, because it has mm-hmm. to be... Um, it's got to be something that pushes us forward or pulls us forward. However you think either push or pull, but you know, there's got to be something that we're going for this. I don't know, this perspective of being grateful, but, but not Mm -hmm. done. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your journey, you know, into your fourth company. Like maybe it's let's reverse it all the way to 19. What was that company or how did you even get involved? Like you entrepreneurialism, Mm -hmm. how did you clash together? So I've had this question a few times and I just want to like, say, I love hearing some of these entrepreneurs being like, when I was 12, I was selling lemonade on the streets. (laughs) I think way more people were selling lemonades on the street than people starting companies. So 
I just, yeah. sometimes people dig deep and that, that that's great. But truthfully, you know, I started working for what we today call a startup when I was 18, 19. This is like 16 years ago. So they were not called a startup. They were not cool. Everyone was like, what are you doing? And why are you there? There was right. no perks. Like what today, right. what we say working for startups is very different. Yeah. Uh, but it was really cool. And I just felt right at home. I was part of the small team at like school. I knew nothing, but still I was like making stuff happen. And I was yeah. an important part of building this company with a very small team. And it just really, really felt like such an eye-opening experience. Yeah. And it gave me a lot of confidence to say, okay. well, if, if I can do this for you, I can, I can do this for me too. I don't have to be hired by a startup to run a startup because that's essentially what I was I felt like I was doing. So that, that initial experience of being, being hired by yeah. another entrepreneur, seeing it up close. Again, this is not in the newspapers at this time. This is not what people are striving right. to do. <clears throat> so I really hadn't thought of tech as a world or startups as a world before then. Right. And this was a, 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 you know, a really weird like web push trying to do something on the internet. I couldn't even explain it today because it's just it's so far from what we know <laughs> works today. The came change. out of that. Yeah, it's really, it's a different world. But I came out of that and I launched an e-commerce company. And again, like we didn't have Shopify like we have. We didn't have, right. you know, Facebook and Google and all the marketing tools that we have. So it was a very different experience. But I launched an e-commerce that I have had acquired after two years. One of the issues and problems that I had was marketing because I had to go to like 20 different websites and buy banner spaces. Right. <laughs> because again, we didn't have what we use as marketing tools today. Right. So coming out of the e-commerce company, I launched an ad network and I ran that for a period of five years, took that to five com- countries in Europe. Um, and in, in that time started, you know, dabbling with ad, ad tech and like bigger media company type type of holdings. And that's the company when, you know, I was 26, I, I kind of came to a conclusion that I needed to go and do something else. It was a beautiful company that made good money, but it wasn't necessarily scalable to what I, the companies that I wanted to build. It didn't have the mission and the vision. Sure. So I stayed on as chair board and I stayed on, on as shareholder and I just sold that company last year. Nice. So I had it in holding for like a good 12 years, which, you know, great team, such a fun, fun journey. So really nice to put a bow on that journey too, in the end. And coming out of that, I, I was kind of like, had this vision and mission in my mind then that I really want to build companies that make people healthier. So my first step at that was to build a peer to peer marketplace for fitness. So we, we built this app Uber for fitness, anyone that was good in sport or work, I could share it in the app, we raised capital. All of these three companies were out of Sweden. So raised capital for that one in Europe. That's the company that actually moved me to San Francisco about nine years ago. Wow. And if you want to do like a podcast on like, why does peer to peer marketplaces don't, why don't they work? I, <laughs> you got all I have the answers huh? for weeks. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. I don't know if I have the answers, but I have a lot of thoughts and opinions. We really yeah. tried. We got 250 bookings in the platform a day after just six months. So like the demand was there, but keeping a supply side to do what they're supposed to do was really hard. Yeah. Uh, and I think we've seen that with so many peer to peer marketplaces, like people have tried to home cleanings for right. different types of services. And as soon as you like rely on one specific person showing up, the model kind of breaks. Yep. So that happened to us too. And in the end, we needed to pivot to being a SaaS platform and, We found a soft landing and that company really, one of the big learnings was like really getting in and say, we need more people active. We're going to help them to move. It's really clear coming out on the other side, feeling like, well, if you don't eat what you're supposed to, like working out doesn't matter. So that what brought me into food and really had me start thinking about food as an industry and what can I build in food that can be sizable and big and have an impact. Yeah. And on that journey, we ran into this huge sustainability issue of so much food just being tossed away. And then on the other side, really thinking, yeah, people need to eat healthier, but also people are just struggling to actually put food on the table. Right. We, let's solve the biggest problem first, and then we can evolve to making sure that they also eat super healthy, you know? Yeah. So 
what I've done when you look at it from like a high level feels like there's so many different things, but the one thing really led into understanding a challenge or a big problem that needs solving for my next venture and yeah. where I went with it. <clears throat> yeah. I was just going to say the same thing that it, it actually is a beautiful picture of one thing leading to the next. And, and yeah. you got into an industry, realized that there was a problem over here and, and right. you kind of, you've been jumping problems, which is fantastic. <laughs> this is what problem solvers do, but I, I want to just encourage the listener through this. And I want to, I want to know your opinion on this because mm. sometimes, you know, as a business owner, you, you know, like we're committed, we're all in. Right. But what you said earlier really hit with me because I've related to it myself, even in my own, you know, multiple industries and different businesses that I've done different. We have different vehicles. Like you've got, you've got your Toyota and you got your Corvette or whatever, you know, d- you know, depiction that you want to give here. And so in essence, when you realize that this isn't the vehicle for me, it wasn't going to scale as big as I wanted to, or mm-hmm. get the ultimate result that I was hoping for. Is that like a, a shameful moment of like, Oh, like now I have to change or switch. Or is it like, I have to give up this team. I mean, you really, you I mean you held on to that company for 12 years. It was a great team, like, but there was bigger or maybe better or just different things for you, a different vehicle. So if someone's contemplating this and thinking like, okay, well, maybe I'm in this business now, but maybe I won't always be, is that kind of how it rolls for entrepreneurs? Give us some insight there. So I have a few different experiences with this. My first company, you know, it was a great start because I had this e-com. It was acquired after two years, like my first stab at it. So I rolled into the next, just thinking this will be better and bigger and all the things. Yeah, it, it was a beautiful company. I but I should I should probably have left earlier than what I did. I think it was still okay. I probably could have left six months earlier, not keeping on to that CEO role. But it's hard. It's your baby and it's your team. And right. how that company really came to like when I decided I needed to hire someone else and move on, I was right. already really deep in this other idea. It was almost like instead of like breaking up and taking time and finding your new love. I was like already in love when I was like, okay, I have something else here that, that, you know, has the vision and mission and like all the excitement of it could be a unicorn kind of. So in that sense, it was when I made the decision to leave my second company as an operator, it was easy. And again, I probably could have done like an earlier cut and have some time in between, but I was 26 and it, it was what I needed to do yeah. with my third company. And again, my second company later was acquired, like, and, and I left on a good note and stayed, stayed involved with, with, the, with the team. So, so everything felt really good for me. Sure. My third company, when we needed to pivot right. and it got really hard, I could have, I should have let go of that company a lot earlier. I, as many other, to your point, I think as an entrepreneur, one of the things that we have is stamina because it is hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work, lots of ups and downs. And I think one of probably, you know, one of the strongest skills that many entrepreneurs have is, is just grit and stamina. Yeah. And that That's makes good. it really hard, harder when, so my second company was working really well, just I needed something different. And that, that is not as shameful. That's, like you're right. moving on to something bigger. Right. I think my third company, I should have just walked away at one point. Right. And I pushed through and I spent probably a year more than I should have yeah. to like land in this new pivot and find a soft landing for that company. And I really, I think wanted to prove to myself and maybe everyone else that like I could do it. Yeah. And yeah, like it happened. But if I had used that year for myself, for my own purposes to something right. else, right. that time would have been better used for me. Yeah. So, and it's hard when you have, we, you know, with that company, I had external investors. I want to make sure that I show that I right. cared about them and, uh, yeah. you know, all the things, but yeah, that's a really hard, taking a hard look at yourself in the mirror when things are not going as well and kind of yeah. like killing your, your, your darling is hard. And I think it's one of the most important things that we can do because we only have so many years to really do something with our time. Yeah. I, the vulnerability that you just shared, I think is incredible of being able to like, not only reflect, but then to be honest with yourself about how one worked and how the other one, maybe not so much at that time. You know, I think every entrepreneur struggles with this idea of 
I got a lot of thoughts. I got a lot of ideas, a lot of, you know, unicorns, you know, possibilities. And, and so some of it's like, you know, disseminating like which one's the best. And then I, then I pick, and then there's like, okay, I got to commit to this for a while. Cause if I do like two or three things at the same time, that's not good either. So for you, would you say that it was like this, you know, I, I just feel like you've just ascended kind of each time, you know, towards this greater vision of what you have. Is that because you know exactly where you're going or this clarity of like, oh, I want this type of business or this type of outcome? Or is that is has that just developed over the course of time? Like, how does someone know maybe when to tug and pull? Yeah. You know what I mean? <clears throat> That's a good question. And and listen, when I I decided that I wanted to do something in food, this is I think a good example of like nothing is a clear path. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just a personal opinion. I actually, side note, I think when people have like, when they introduce their partner, like, oh yeah, love at first sight. I'm like, no, no, there's more here. But <laughs> there's never a straight line. Right, mm-hmm. that's right. Not for entrepreneurs but, at least. No. And I um, I started focusing on sort of like the food industry five years ago. And I took three years and I MVP'd a ton of different things. So I launched a food brand, I started working with influencers and like producing things for them. I can't even remember. I had a lot yeah. of things going on. Yeah. Uh, and as I, you know, every, every, and I kind of knew, like I need to just like MVP a few things. Like right. nothing can be precious. Things just need to get out there in the ether and we'll see what sticks or not. Like throwing That's spaghetti right. on the wall and see what sticks is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to give yourself time. You need to be really quick on cutting things that don't work, yeah. right? Yeah. So I gave myself permission to do that for like a period of three years. And at, towards the end of that, I found my co-founder, Kari. And that was like a big unlock to me. So I was like, yeah. all right, I have my person. Yep. And I knew I wanted a co-founder on my next adventure. And that spun up the process of like another test. And that led to Marty. So yeah. <clears throat> Long-winded way of saying, I think giving yourself permission, especially when you're starting out to like think of things as MVPs yep. and just really like give them a run for a period of time, being really like clear with yourself of what goals and KPIs and targets you want to hit if to to decide if it's successful or not. And that's very helpful to do before you start a test because otherwise you can get in love with your own idea. And right. even though it's not working, it's really hard to quit. Sure. And then you're you know, it just at never ending. So setting up targets, setting up KPIs and goals, giving yourself permission for a period of time to achieve those. And if not cut it and move on, if you're looking for a business idea, I think is, is a very smart way of approaching things. And I also think like when you're in MVP stage, you can actually test a few things at the same time. Yeah. If you want to just like learn more. And if you're organized enough to do multiple things. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible answer. I hope that the listener is taking good notes because I think that for the most part, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have a lot of ideas, right? Or maybe a lot of passions, a lot of like, I could go this way, I could go that way. And so you're right. We kind of do need to do this like a little bit of a shake and determine yeah. which which way we need to go. At some point though, like you said, you have to kind of determine, okay, so like this one's starting to get some legs. I need to kind of cut away all the other distractions at that point. So you kind of identify, set some targets. And then even at that point, there may still be a take it out back and (laughs) let her go type of a thing, because you already mentioned that before. What, like in that dissemination of like, okay, I got a couple of things, I got a couple of ideas. What for you, were you looking for that? Then you were like, okay, like now this has legs. What, what were some of those maybe key factors that you were looking for that? Like, this is the scenario we want to go in. I mean, truthfully, like, yeah, I think you, you, if you want to test an idea, KPIs, like deciding beforehand. So like for, for Marty, for instance, an easy test on like, are people converting? Like you can, you can do really easy tests Buy buy a few impressions with an ad and have a landing page and see if people click through and buy. And right. um, if you have time to like be by with the test for like two months, are they coming back to buy again? Right. If you don't have inventory that is real, you can even like fake it, have like a business name and 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 a site that once you try to buy, the site breaks, but you get the data, right? So right. there's depending on like the business, you can you can decide what actual data and tests you want to look at. But yeah. then also, truthfully, it's like 
a gut feel, right? So yeah. as any entrepreneur, you will talk with all your friends and all your business contacts. And one of, I actually think one of my superpowers is I find the right people to talk to. So I didn't know anyone with the online, you know, grocery industry before starting Marty. And in the first month, I feel like I talked to all of the main investors in the space, all of the main entrepreneurs in the space, you know, the, the first hires of some of the big successes and getting their feedback and their view on the market would also like give you a gut feel for what's the opportunity and, and what's the space and the market to grow a big company. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think that's like kind of like the three pillars of my decision tree when I'm looking at go or no. So good. So good. It's funny because I was, you know, obviously I've got a layout here for the show and I asked some of the questions pretty directly to some of the hosts, but we've, we've gone through these good, bad, what, what type of discipline do you have in your decision-making? We've gone through all of these just through our natural conversations. I just so appreciate just your, your flow of thinking. It's super inspiring, but I hope that the listeners paying close attention because you're dropping like super practical things for them to be able to, to be able to implement inside their business. So I do want to, I want to ask you a question regarding traits and, and character. I want to give you two questions around this. I want for you, particularly as a business owner and a, and a, a serial entrepreneur at this point, what has been a trait that you feel like you have that's unexpectedly kept you away from success? So any, okay. I, I was just going to make a reference again to like your partner and your, <laughs> your relationships in life but it's kind of like when you think of your partner the things that you love most about them is usually the things that tick you off most as well <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's, it's like what makes them unique right and i it, same goes for you right so things that like actually are like your superpowers can also flip on the side That's and right. hold you back and you know we've already talked about stamina and yeah. it is one of these things of being like very very committed to see something through and very bullish on things can be a superpower, but it can also definitely hold you back from moving on or like closing a chapter or stop, stop, test, stop the testing, you know? <laughs> so that, yeah. that can definitely be one of the things yeah. I, again, like actually something that can be really uh, powerful is I move really, really fast. And I, 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 I can see something and I find a solution and, and I'm like, I move fast, to like figure it out. And that comes in a super handy, really early in a business. Right. And later on, when you have a bigger team and you need more structure and just a different type of processes, this yep. can come back and bite you oh, yeah. uh, in, in, in a way that it's just, it's not as helpful anymore. Yeah. And I've heard that from, from team members, right? Like, you need to tell us where we're going. You like, you're, you're like running and we don't know what's happening. Kind of like, it's almost, almost right. like yeah. not taking time to really have everyone digest a decision right. that has been made or like where we're going to go next. So yeah. I think those are my two things that I keep working on. And listen, I've worked on these two things in the last 15 years. Uh, so some, <laughs> That's honest. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just when it's a strong personality traits, it's, it's, it's tricky, but I'm very aware of yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think those are probably the two main ones that I think of when, when I hear that question. Yeah, that, that's super good. I think that the, just the honesty there is what comes through because I think, I mean, first off, I mean, you've referenced the word stamina, but like what that means is that, like you said, like I, I'm, I'm in and, and I'm right here and we're not going anywhere until we figure right. out this problem. And uh, there's a stick to a persistence, as you said, that some people just don't have. And man, especially if you're trying to lead a team and and you're all in on this problem and you're trying to get it done. And some people are looking at you like you're crazy because you're up early, up late, you know, dialed in and focused all day long. And they kind of wonder, how do you do it? It's a little bit unrelatable sometimes. And so you're right. Yeah. That can, that can be definitely a downfall, but it's, it's the exact reason why it was successful. So I loved how you gave that, that, you know, right. left, left and right perspective. Yeah. And again, I think for me, it can definitely lead to like, again, not letting go early enough and, yeah. and like, pushing a bit further on things that maybe need to get let go of. But yeah, so. Which is actually interesting. Now that I really think about what you're saying there. So this normally this fast moving, like quick decision making person doesn't necessarily follow through a whole lot. Actually, usually they're kind of like, you know, big visionary, big vision, big picture. And, and then like, I need someone else to cross all the T's, but 
I, I hear you saying that <laughs> you've got the vision. You're actually behind executing and crossing T's and dot and I's, which is just going to lead into my other question here. But am I picking up? Is that is that something that you feel like you do well, or is this? <laughs> yes am I, or no? <laughs> <laughs> yes or no? I think. Listen, I definitely like one of the major like working with my co-founder. She's a great T crosser. <laughs> she, okay, she's so organized and like it. I'm so lucky to have her and the rest of my team. So sure. I think for sure I can like stir up dust and just like, here's the big picture. That's where we're going to run. And like, yep. I do have a team who's like, well, what does it mean <laughs> like, right. to like get all the details <clears throat> in, in a row that maybe I, you know, missed or didn't think of, but then the stamina, like I, I will keep running until we hit that goal. So right. Um, right. definitely follow through, but like not necessarily ask you know, detail organized that I as I yeah. maybe would like to be, but thankfully I have people around me that yeah. are very detail organized. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. That was going to be my next question. What character traits does your co-founder have that you feel like yeah. has complimented you? Well, you've kind of led to some of those things. Would you say anything if I gave you an opportunity to uh, just promote her for a half second about what, what the relationship there and how the, how the dynamic works between the two of you? There's many cool things with Kari. One of the coolest is when you look at Marty.com, it looks so good. And she's like a whiz when it comes to running a design team, like creating a look and feel for a CPG brand. She's yeah. probably one of the best we have in the entire US. Like she's, she's incredible. Wow. So like super artistic, but also very organized. And we have that partnership where number one, is just like a beautiful support system. So again, I'm so happy to have her. I've had a few different co-founders and I just struck like gold with Kari. We understand each other and it's, you know, it's a very tight partnership. And um, yeah, I run fast. We've talked about that, like big vision, like move, moving fast. And uh, she's definitely more organized and making sure like, do we think of X, Y, and Z? So that's when we look at like how we divide and conquer, just like our teams too. She's on the operations part. Yeah. I'm on the marketing sales, like buying side. So yep. that kind of like sets a lot of like where we thrive and the yep. teams that we run. Did you know that ahead of time? You said, I knew I wanted a co-founder. Did you have this picture of this person and then being able to operate those sides of the business? And then the second question to that would be, do you, would you be where you are today? The speed that you've gotten to where you are with Marty, if you had done it on your own? No, let's start with that. I wouldn't know. I've started companies alone. I've been like a sole CEO and it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and no, you don't get the same speed. I think what a co-founder gives you is like that one person that you can always have a fully transparent and honest conversation with. Yeah. And that is, itself unlocks all of the questions that you need to ask and someone else needs to ask, to like figure out the right path. Uh, so no, I would definitely not, I don't know how I would have gotten anywhere. But this is a big project and a very heavy lift to yeah. run Marty with all the operations that goes out to just like sending a box out with yeah. all the groceries that one person would buy. So yeah, no, like I'm so, so lucky to have her. And it's cool. You know, I was introduced to Kari by kind of like a mutual friend okay. uh, that just said she, she actually is a recruiter and I wanted to hire her to find someone, but I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. So I can't, I can't pay you <laughs> right. to find a co-founder when I don't really know what I'm doing yet. And uh, she called me up a few weeks later. And she's like, you just need to meet Kari. I'm not going to charge you. I think this is a perfect match. So she knows what she's wow. doing. It was a pretty amazing match. And uh, the first time I meet Kari is at a coffee shop and we have a conversation of like the food industry and some things that I've been testing and some ideas and I have this one food company going and she just looks at me. She's like, I can help you. I, I can, I can help you. I'm your girl. And, and just meeting someone that's that confident. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I knew from the pretty, beginning, this, this would be a pretty cool partnership. So you mentioned earlier, there's no such thing as love is for sight, love at first sight, but is, is, was there a love at first sight with you and Kari? <laughs> uh, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I was very impressed. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, Definitely I mean, when you're crush, when you're yeah. an executor like she is, I mean, what's there not to be yeah. impressed with? It sounds no, like so. It's very impressive meeting these high achievers that yeah. that come in like that. Yeah, especially as visionaries, we we uh, they have a lot of things that we know that we don't. So it it uh, even more impressive for them to be able to do those things that we know that we wish we were better at, but that they do so well and so naturally. So that's great. 
we're going to switch over to the speed round here. I'm going to ask you a question about your KPIs. The way I like to say it is if you could only track one thing inside of Marty, what would it be? Retention. <clears throat> People come back again and again. Like if you have a cycle of repeatables, things work. I think for my business, which is a consumer facing e-commerce, I think that is the most important KPI to know that we're doing, we're, we're crafting experience that, that can grow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for for a for a lot of businesses, but for yours specifically, for you to be able to double and triple and quadruple and and hundred x, it, it, you're going to have to have those same people coming back, time for and time sure. again. Like if you don't have you know returning customers, you're not going to see like that. Also tips over to having word of mouth, organic growth. Like people yeah. are happy, so it just it just tells you way more than just the repeatables. I think of right. just are you nailing the customer experience? The you know the. The customer experience. I mean, we could. I mean, we could probably do a whole podcast just on that. But you, you just trickled in some really, really important nuggets. But when you have an experience, as opposed to just like click, click, you know, I got my food. It was like, you know, meh, you know. But like when, when I, oh, like, oh no, no, it was Marty, and mm -hmm. I remember the experience, and I went treasure hunting or whatever this this experience is. Do you guys, do you guys think about like a feeling that you want to leave your customer with? Is it like what they walk away with? Like, give us just a yeah. little insight there. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when you win on the lottery, mm -hmm. that's what you should feel like. Like I, I promise anytime you shop at Marty, you save 50% on um, like average for what you spend at the grocery store. And if you just let that sink in and you start right. seeing like the savings you can get in a year yeah. and we get all the big brands and like really we also have like a huge organic section and all the good stuff that you want to get. Like you should, you should feel like you won the lottery. Like, wow, I got all these, these great stuff for this price and, and I'm saving the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, you should yeah. feel really good about yourself. So, and we've been thinking about awesome. this a lot because today, what, you know, shopping affordable foods, going to the $1 store, it's not going to get you that feeling. Like right. it's just not. And the yeah. types of foods that the $1 store sells is not, necessarily it's that you would feel great about serving your family either so again i think you know the ikea foods is like a good mantra to me because i yeah. do feel like people go to ikea they shop affordable but they also feel great because it looks good it's modern it's cool i want that feeling to hit you when your box marty box does on your porch you're just like yeah. man i did something great for the environment without even trying right. and i'm getting awarded for it because i'm saving so much money yeah so yeah, so we're thinking through that in our coffee, in our design, that it's playful and fun. So that's kind of our, our own mantra, like trying to craft this experience. Yeah, yeah, experience can mean so many things. We did a great job giving us that immediate word picture. That's what I want to point out to the listener. When I asked about the experience, you gave me a word picture of, do you know what it feels like when you win the lottery? And immediately everyone's like, oh yeah, I mean, well, mm -hmm. maybe I haven't won the lottery, but I can only imagine the incredible feeling it would be to be like, whoa, I won, you know? And, and that immediately took us to that place. And so I think that it gave a, just a great depiction of how the listener can do it for their own business. What resource or maybe book would you recommend for a business owner looking to grow this year? Okay, so this might be a wild one, but I'm thinking The Obstacle is the Way. Okay. I think his name is Ryan Holiday. It's this book about really, it's, it's a Greek, like old, old time, like philosophy, stoicism really flipping the side of like the challenges that you run into yeah. maybe your opportunities yeah so it's all about like shifting your thinking of like instead of being stuck in challenges and problems that that occurs how can you flip that to being like either don't let it touch you just move right. on to something that actually is something that you can you you can have an effect on yep. so don't touch anything that is beyond your control don't spend any you know headspace, <laughs> yep. getting yep. muddled with that and just focus on what you actually can control and use that to your, your advantage. And I'm saying that because yep. again, like running a company is, is hard and there's so many books of like, it's a great and like all the classics, but yep. I think headspace and like mental well-being, making sure that you take care of yourself, making sure that you're not like, there's it, a lot of pressure. There's a lot yeah. of stress and how, how you yep. manage and handle that Yep. is going to affect your own efficiency and your impact with the work that you're doing and how long you can keep pushing, right? 
Yep. So yeah, I think that could be like a good book for anyone to read. No, that's great. Great recommendation. The headspace, mindset, mental stamina. We've we've used a lot of words here on this show that, that can help a listener, but it is true. And I don't know if what the percentage is, 50%, 90%, but it feels like a lot bigger percentage is mindset and just sheer like, how am I dealing with certain things here first and, and then as an external expression? <clears throat> and I think that uh, you're right. If you can get that piece of it right, there's just so many more things that just kind of just lay down that aren't real ob- obstacles as long as you can get the, the headspace right. Would you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Okay. What, what do you think about intentionally networking or masterminding with other entrepreneurs? Man, I had a period in my life where I was like, I don't have time for this. I'm too busy. And listen, it's, yep. it's, it's so valuable and it's so important. And it's shocking when you've been out of it for a period of time and you come back and you realize yeah, the conversations good. you can have, how you can help each other, everything from like getting the best talent to, of course, like, everything's a network on, on top of that. If you, if you want to get an external investments and financing, like you need to know the right people. So it's shocking how, you know, going to have a, you know, a social fun time at a network can actually be business, but yep. it is extremely important. Yeah. It's interesting. Once you have that recognition, how much more you see it in everything because you see, yeah, yeah the social event or whatever, but then, then you see the strategy inside of Mm -hmm. building relationship, which doesn't have to be like cookie cutter strategy. It's just, it can be genuine. It can be authentic, but that's what it starts with is the, we came together, but then out of that built a relationship and then, oh yeah, we invested or we, we did a deal together. You found a co-founder, you know, so forth and so on. hundred percent, hundred percent. I got a question for you about family. I know you got, you got a family, you got some, you got some kiddos. We talked about our kiddos before we hit the record button. And for you as a extremely high driving entrepreneur, one with lots of stamina and, and energy and excitement around what you're doing and just like this press, you know, this constant press, I can only imagine. How have you over the years been able to do just that same exact kind of energy and passion with your family? I, I'll tell you a quick belief that I have. I don't believe in balance. I don't believe that mm-hmm. there's this like cool. tightrope of family and marriage over here and business over here. And like, I'm constantly not nah, like, just forget that. What I need to do is go hard after all of it. So mm-hmm. how have you done that? So <clears throat> complete transparency. I do have periods of times where I feel like, God, I need another 20 hours a week for work. And oh, if I only could have like another two days a weekend with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. hey, it's just because everything is so fun and I want more of it, you know, but I don't know. I, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I count my blessings every day. I feel like I'm, I have like really two really fun kids and, and, and husband and we, we get to spend the mornings and the weekends together. And then I have a lot of fun at work. I wouldn't work this hard if I didn't have so much fun doing what I do. Right. So I don't know if I have an answer. I really do get into the bucket of like, oh, I need more hours in the week for yeah. both. Yeah. But we 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 do do it all. We yeah. we're out there and we're you know spending time with friends and we're traveling and we take the kids to activities and then we run this company. I'm on your side. I think you just need to go for it and make it happen. We had this crazy fall where my husband spent a ton of time in London, so we had a travel schedule of being in LA and Stockholm and London and with school and work. And I guess, well, it, it happened and we yeah. made, we made seemingly it impossible, but it happened. Yeah. So I yeah. don't know. It's like, maybe, maybe a bit of, it's like, don't think of it so much, but just, just do it. And, and I, I do think there's a thing of like more experiences in life wins. So I think okay. also actually both me and my husband have that as like, well, more experiences wins, even if it feels like it's impossible and like a lot of work to do it all yep. in the end, it's always more fun to get more experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And the experiences can be the fun part. It can be the, with the kids part, it could be the traveling part. It could be the stressful, like, let's figure it out because that's how you learn problem solving part. You know, yeah. I think that all of those different tug and pull situations that you just described are super important. Luis, I got one last question here for you. This might sound a little odd because you're still a, a young entrepreneur, but if you could whisper in the younger Luis's ear, what would you say? Oh, <clears throat> I've had that question a few times as well. I'm like, 
Jesus, what's what's a smart thing to say? <laughs> uh, you know what? I think it's like for anyone, I think it's the, probably the best thing you can hear because you're doing it. Yeah. It's so easy to think that we're smart now. And I'm just saying this because it's funny. I started doing like a yearly journaling every New Year's when I was 21. Okay. And I look back now at like 21 year old Louise. I'm like, oh God, you thought that was hard and that was difficult. Well, you have no idea what life has like in, yeah. in store for you. Yep. Uh, and I'm probably going to say the same thing in 15 years again from right. where I like where I'm sitting now. Yep. So listen, this has been so fun to like chat about business and like my experience. I'm sure we have so many listeners that actually I could learn from. And right. I, I know that I know like in the grand scheme of things, nothing, which is what makes life so amazing and like stay right. curious and learn is, 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 is what we're here for. But I don't know, like everyone has their journey. We all end up where we are supposed to. So I think the one thing any younger generation could just need is just like, you're doing it. You're going to, you're going to do whatever you need to. You're going to end up exactly where you need to be. Yeah. Would you, would you knowing that, knowing that basically kind of the chips fall where they may, that's kind of what I just kind of took from from what it was, what were you giving yourself permission to just go for it? Or was it take, take even more risk or like, what, what is the, maybe the tangible tactical that the younger Luis would, would, would go about? It's so, it's so hard. I don't know. I think it's really hard. Like we, we, I, I this is a longer conversation, Chas. I don't believe in free will. I don't, okay. I don't think we actually have free will necessarily. So okay. all the decisions that we make is like this makeup of like the experience that, that, that we have since before and like, you know, how we read the world at the moment in time. Well, you know, yeah. it's a long conversation, but that's why, like, I think anyone looking back on themselves just like needs to be really kind to themselves. Yeah. We did the best we could with what we knew and what we had to work with. Yep. And there may have been things that I should have done better or like. I should have like taken bigger risks or I should have sure. left that company earlier. Like, of course right. I made a million mistakes, but also we also just like, man, we judge, you know, oneself so hard all the time and we need to be really, really kind to ourselves and our, in our past selves that we've done the best we could. Yeah. There's no, there's no rewriting those chapters now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, it's not like a, a, a good soundbite answer, but it's no, it's, it's, it, <laughs> it, it, hey, look, that's why I asked the question, because I want it to be authentic. <laughs> and so I think that if anything, you've given us a couple of things to mull over as we come across a, just like a mind blowing conversation with an incredible entrepreneur. So Luis, how can, how can they find you? They want to, they want to shop number one. How can they find you? You've already given us yeah. the website, but give us a little promo here. And then how can they find you if they want to pick your brain and, and maybe do a deal yeah. with you? Cool. Well, yeah, come see us at marty.com, M-A-R-T-I-E. So that can be a question sometimes if it's a why or not, but it's not marty.com. And then come find me at LinkedIn. I know my, my, my last name is a bit tricky and my first name can be tricky too. Louise, everyone's like, you're not 89 years old. We're a Mexican man. How does it work? But listen, in Europe, this is a very trendy name. I promise. <laughs> I promise in Europe, I'm like super trendy. It's just I'm really dying weird. over here. This is, this is amazing. Well, if I can say, so, if I can say your last name, surely they can type it and find you on LinkedIn, but don't worry. Yeah. We'll put the link in the show notes. They could just click and find Sweet. you. Wow. Yeah. Way to, what a way to end it with a, with a ginormous smile and a laugh. You've been sensational. Thank you so much for being here. Yes. The, the listeners would be silly not to go back and listen to this one again and, and reach out and, and take advantage of, of this new connection in their network. So thank you for being here. Blessings on your family and your kids and your, and your you. husband and all the things that you have your hand to with Marty. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing literally over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight, and nine figure business owners, is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings literally exists to 
bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.